Hey, oh, 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 hey, hi, what's up? Welcome, hey. Um, you know when you're doing data analysis and you visualize things, that's pretty cool. Hello, welcome. Um, yeah, so today I'm gonna start with the zombie data set. This is a data set um, kept by the World Health Organization on um, zombie consumption because when the United States decided to pull from the WHO, Nazis, seriously, my country is run by morons and Nazis. Yay. So when the United States pulled out of the WHO, there was a provision in the um, legal guidelines of the WHO that they're not allowed to do zombie research. But when the US pulled out, that was one of the contingencies of the contract that they could start doing uh, zombie research. So, um, so civilization may be ending in the United States, but at least we have zombie research. So you win some, you lose some, I guess. And for this data set, um, barely past ethical guidelines, they put zombies into a room with pigs. Not humans, thank God. Um, pigs. Um, and they wanted to evaluate how much of the pigs they consumed. Based on how many days the zombie had been a zombie for, their aggression score, highly validated instrument right there, um, the proportion of tattoos, because, I mean, you may have heard of this, it's kind of a silly rumor, but there's, there's rumors out there that if you get a tattoo, then you're going to be protected from zombies, and... I know it sounds like pseudoscience, but you have to evaluate it just to address criticisms. Um, and then uh, some of the pig carcasses were living, some of them were not living. And captivity score means how long the zombie was kept in captivity. So it's roughly a measure of how hungry they are. Um, and then the name of the zombie because zombies are people too. The more you know as well as the birthday of the zombies. And if you're interested in using this data set, I mean, I'd recommend it. It might save your life. Um, so feel free to visit the link in the description. So maybe you want to look at the relationship between the aggression score and the number of ounces of meat they eat from the pig carcass, um, as well as captivity and the proportion of tattoos. And Maybe you get a plot like this. Now, this is a lot of information. A lot of information at once. And, uh, yeah, it is a lot of information. Information overload. And if you are anything like my students, you find it very hard to interpret these things. Like, why are we putting all the variables there at once? Like, dude, why not just look at one variable at a time? Well, that's kind of important. Because if you are trying to model all these variables, the assumption is that there are no interactions in the model except the ones that you have explicitly modeled. So it's very important to actually look at the graph and see if there is any evidence of interactions. But even then, students have trouble with this and it's understandable. And why? Because of those gosh darn lowest lines, man. They're so bumpy, man. Um, if you want to review what a lowest line is, I'll leave a link somewhere. So the strength and the weakness of lowest lines is they bend with the data. And so sometimes it makes it hard to tell if lines are parallel, because that's kind of one of the reasons you look at these plots. You look for evidence of non-parallel lines. And so are these plots parallel? I don't know, because they're all bendy and stuff. Well, what do you do? Well, I'm going to introduce the strategy that I introduced to my students, and I didn't realize I was using it. Like, students are like, how do you know that? And I'm like, I don't know how I know that. Let me think about it. And then I thought about it, and then I learned. So now I'm teaching you. And I do something called averaging by eye. And so the basic idea, well, before we do the basic idea, I'm just going to keep you in anticipation and stuff. Uh, let's go ahead and simplify this plot. Instead of looking at a 3x3 three three grid, let's go ahead and look at a 2x3 grid. Why not? And that just reduces the number of plots we have to look at. But still, we have this trouble with this thing. And are these lines parallel and whatnot? What do you do? All right, now I can introduce the idea of averaging by eye. Basically, what I do is I think about the beginning of the lowest line. So I'm just going to take this quadrant right here and mentally put 
a dot or an X or something like that. And then I'm going to take the end of the data right here and put a dot or an X or whatever. And then I'm going to initially draw a line between the two. And so then what I do is I compare the lowest line to this line and say, is that line a good average representation of this lowest line? And in some instances, like in this one, yeah, does pretty good. But other instances, like this one, maybe it doesn't do so good. So then what do I do? I don't know if you've ever used uh, Adobe Illustrator or there are several programs that use this, but there's a tool that allows you to create a bend. And how you do it is you click on one point and then another point, and then you click somewhere in the middle and drag out a radius that shows kind of curvature. And so that's what I think about when I do this is I find a point in the middle and then I imagine that being the radius and I say, does this better represent the lowest line? And in this case right here, yeah, it kind of does. So if I'm averaging by I in this particular quadrant, I might say, yeah, that looks like that might be kind of a curvilinear relationship. Whereas this quadrant right here, mm, probably not. And I realize just now I'm calling it a quadrant when there are six graphs, a sextant. Wow, this got spicy real quick. Okay, so we're talking about sextants today. Um, and I'm inclined, that's just a mouthful to say, so we're just gonna say the sex. So in this sex, yeah, it looks pretty flat, looks pretty straight, looks like there's no bends, but in this sex, however, there's definitely a bend. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> Moving along. Um, so that's the basic idea behind inferencing by eye. You place a dot at either end, draw a straight line, see if that represents the lowest line. If it doesn't, you can kind of drag that line and see if that's a better representation. And sometimes I might even do two bends. But that's just getting complicated and I'm not going to worry about that. No, I'm not going to. So that's the basic idea. But let me give you at least one caveat, if not more. Let's look at this sex tint. Uh, if we were to do that, we would place a dot here and dot here, draw a line, say, oh, it doesn't represent it, draw the bend and say, okay, it looks like there is this very rather large quadratic relationship going on here. But you would be deceived because remember one thing about lowest lines is they're super, super sensitive to outliers. And so this dot right here is massively influencing that lowest line. And if we were to repeat the same process, but ignore that dot and instead place the end of the data here, it would look like a straight line. In other words, without that single dot, it is linear. With that one dot, it is massively quadratic. So in situations like that, where you know the lowest line and the end of the data is just dragged by an outlier, I just basically trim that off and then look at just the non-outliers. And if we were to put all that together and do our inference by eye, we can see that for the most part, um, we have fairly parallel lines, except that we do have a quadratic bend in here. And it seems like these, these medium tattooed pigs um, tend to have no relationship between how long they've been in captivity in ounces, and there's a slightly positive relationship for all the other ones. So maybe there's some evidence of an interaction. I'm not actually going to model that because I don't care. That's not the purpose of this video. Now, that's what I do. Um, but I realize there's kind of an alternative strategy that's easier by a bit. And that is to actually fit quadratic lines. So if I had to do that in Flexplot, instead of writing this, I would instead write this, where method equals quadratic, and it will actually fit quadratic lines in each sex tint. And we would get something that looks like this. So without doing that sort of like imagining dots and lines and radii and that sort of thing, um, much easier way of doing it. Um, but we do see a couple problems still. One is that sometimes it averages too much, like in this quadrant, um, relative to the lowest line. And actually, 
relative to the lowest line, which was in this plot, um, we see some of the bends are missed. So maybe that would be a plot that would be good for a cubic. But we could actually also do a cubic too, just like in this plot. And so we see that that approximates the lowest line a lot better. Um, but other caveats, uh, just like lowest lines, sometimes the quadratic or the cubic lines can also be sensitive to outliers. And so we see that we still have the same problem in this particular sex tint um, where we don't get that outlier there. And so regardless of which method you use, whether you use lowest lines or quadratic or cubic, hopefully you can use these tools to get a better idea of what's going on in your data. Yeah, and try to find parallel lines and non-parallel lines. And if there's non-parallel lines, you model that. And if you want to know how to do that, I'm totally going to leave a link in the video description on a series I did on visualization that will teach you how to do that. It was based on my paper about visual partitions. That's the word. So I'm thinking this is... Uh... Let me see here. So far, this video is 15 minutes of recording time, and I messed up a lot, and that's going to be cut down by quite a bit. So, yeah, you get a short video today. But I can't leave without reminding you to visit simplistics.net. Now tell me, why would I ever visit simplistics.net? Fabulous question. Fabulous. If you want to be a stats ninja, you would visit simplistics.net. If you want to be, like, amazing, visit simplistics.net. If you want like happiness and fulfillment all the rest of your life, the key to that happiness is simplistics.net. I cannot state it simpler than that. Yeah, because you can take self-guided courses where you learn on your own in a Canvas course and take quizzes and discussion boards and ask me questions and that sort of thing. Or you can do a live class, which is kind of better because we get to Zoom every week for two hours a week. And we got a couple classes coming up and I'm not going to make the mistake of telling you exactly when the classes are because I've done that in the past and decided to wait on publishing a video. And then I'm like, hey, visit my class uh, in September of 1857. And that has clearly passed. So I'm not going to do that now. I'm just going to say there's classes in the future and you should sign up so we can hang out and stuff. So anyway, hopefully this has been helpful. If it hasn't, um, that's okay. Yeah. Feel free to leave your questions or comments below. And I will see you next time. Peace out, friends and enemies. Bye.